The UN estimates that by 2050 there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. It's estimated that 100 million tons of plastic are generated globally each year. Local authorities have been forced to close beaches due to mounds of plastic rubbish. Hello, I'm Tammy Vendange, an executive turned social entrepreneur. It's clear that Mother Nature has a plastics problem, but I think it's time to quit talking about the problem. Instead, let's talk about the solutions. This is a business podcast with an environmental mission. And as your host of the Plastics Revolution, I'm going to chat with the innovators, change makers, and fellow entrepreneurs who are leading the way in fighting plastic waste. Along the way, we'll also share tips and practical ideas so that you too can be part of the solution. This is the Plastics Revolution. Royston Kent is an outdoor enthusiast and the co-founder and CEO of BNC Plastics. His business is a product development and plastics manufacturing company based in Brisbane, Australia. Royston was in this industry for more than a decade when he and his business partner, Bob Hossel, decided to buy BNC, which was an undermanaged company at the time. Today, Royston's company is actively seeking and recommending the use of recycled plastic feedstock to their clients. But this wasn't always the case, and even now, it's quite unusual in this plastics manufacturing industry in general. In this episode, Royston shares his business journey and why he had a recent change of heart that has completely changed his company's strategic direction, one that is putting sustainability in the heart of all they do. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Plastics Revolution with Royston Kent of BNC Plastics. Royston, welcome to the show. Tammy, thank you so much. I thought we should start off with a little story about how we first met. I was looking for a plastics manufacturer, and I was specifically looking for one who did something with recycled plastic. And I have to say, there weren't a lot of choices when I did a Google search here in Australia. But I came across a story on your website. It was specifically a case study of one of your clients called Five Oceans. Do you want to talk about that project and how you got involved? Well, I think uh, one, we're certainly grateful maybe that some of our competitors haven't caught to that space yet, and you did find us, Tammy, so thank you for that. I would say that Five Oceans, when Louisa and Felix first contacted us, they had this vision. They're both surfers, and they had this vision where they wanted just to give back, and they wanted to literally take ocean waste and create their own products. And the, the surfboard fins was just the first of that project. But the plastic wasn't from just anywhere. That actually was imported into Australia, wasn't it? It was, yeah. So what they realized was that they do a lot of surfing. They've surfed a lot throughout the world. And in rough numbers, about 65% of all ocean waste just sits above us here north of Australia in south of Asia. And... They do a lot of surfing in, in and around Bali, and anyone that's been to Bali has would have seen firsthand the ocean waste that, that is there. And they genuinely wanted to, to give back and create their products from ocean waste. So they actually engaged with a company, a recycling company in Indonesia, and that is where they actually sourced the ocean waste material from, which we then imported into Australia. So an Australian company importing waste from Bali. That usually happens the other way, doesn't it? It certainly does, yes. <laughs> I was actually in Bali in September last year surfing myself, and I saw that waste too. So once the waste came to Australia, where did it go? The waste had actually been cleaned and recycled to a point where it was now in a pellet form. So as a manufacturer, we could now actually process that material. And that's where we started doing our trials at that, at that point. Okay. And what product did you create? We created some surfboard fins. Surfboard yeah. fins? Yeah. Were they targeted for like a tourist industry or just anyone in general? Uh, look, that's probably a really good question that Felix and Alex, uh, Felix and uh, Louise would be able to answer a lot better than me. But there was certainly uh, some, some science and some engineering that actually went into the actual 
to the the fin itself because I know the guys were very conscious on how rigid it needed to be and the more advanced the surfer was the more rigidity was needed in the fin so there was a, there was some consideration there in the actual material and in the actual design of the fin were you able to use 100% recycled plastic in that product? As a base, we were, yeah. As the base, it was 100% recycled. And what we did have to do, we had to add some, we did have to put some additives back into it. We did have to uh, add some glass fiber and we had to add also some impact modifiers. Okay. So you said that was just the first of their um, product line. Have you continued to work with them with recycled plastic from Bali? It's interesting, actually, because Alex, uh, Alex, uh, Felix and Louisa, they both contact us probably every month, every every month or two months they do. They're, they're quite innovative in their thinking and they've got a few products up their sleeve. And they, they actually introduce us to other people that are, I think are on the, have the same awareness that, you know, they genuinely want to create products. And if we can reuse and recycle, then that's exactly the same kind of methodology these people are looking to apply. I actually have a conference call scheduled with Felix, uh, with Alex and Louisa today at 5 p.m. actually, and they're both back in Munich at the moment. Ah, okay, interesting. I mean, we're just talking about one project. You, you've had hundreds of clients through here. What percentage of your clients, say, in the last few years are actually requesting recycled plastic? Yeah, very few. I think that's to do with uh, probably us as an industry, because uh, as an industry, it's much easier for a manufacturer to source a prime material and develop a product around a prime material. And look, why is that easier? Because from a processing perspective, you know what you're going to get. You know that if the supplier says you're going to get this material, you've got the continuity, you've got the same repeatability from a manufacturing process. So well, the manufacturer has no issues and the client has no issues in terms of maybe substandard product going to the marketplace. What has changed, though, in recent times, actually recycling, reuse, reduce, we're seeing that more and more now uh, through the media where people are becoming more self-aware. So more and more businesses now are are opting to look at this as a serious option. We can separate and clean the materials and we can now get better continuity of supply. So there are now more materials on offer for manufacturers like ourselves to consider, which obviously we can then consider for different products. And are those recycled materials from Australia? They, look, to be honest, there are, there are a couple of companies. I can give a company a plug actually here, Martog. They've got a new material called Marpet, which is 100% recycled, uh, recycled PET. And they've actually just got some FDA approvals for their manufacturing plant and food, which means it's food grade, and for a couple of their materials. Wow. There's also another company that reached out to me from Cairns, and they were saying just recently that another company called Astron Plastics actually has a fully recycled milk bottle and they're actually doing some extrusion and we're looking at doing a co-collaboration there from an injection molded perspective on manufacturing these parts from 100% milk bottles. Wow okay that's a huge deal because just sort it to milk bottles has been a challenge I know for a lot of councils. Yeah 100%. Before we go into the manufacturing process really deep. I want to get to know you a little bit more. I think that your story is interesting in terms of how you got into manufacturing to begin with, and obviously with your accent in mind. Uh, We both didn't start here in Australia. So what brought you to Australia? Really good question. So I actually, I was born in in Surrey uh, in 1970, so no hiding my age here. (laughs) And My family actually moved to Adelaide when I was one. So we lived in Adelaide until I was seven years old. We then moved from Adelaide to Brisbane until I was 13. We then moved back to the UK. And so from the age of 13 to 27, I lived in the UK. And I actually fell into the industry in the UK where I was... I was, I was looking for more. I knew that I'd been lucky enough to travel with my family from a very young age and travel the world. So I was very lucky to see that. And I knew there was more on offer than living in the current town, Boston, Lincolnshire. I knew there was just more to life on offer. And I, 
I was I knew my only way out was to do something other than what I was doing. And I actually thought my way out was to join the army. So I was actually waiting for my army dates to come through. Oh, no kidding. And I'd I'd been accepted in and they told me I had a six month wait list and I just actually closed down my first business which was a franchise selling uh, sports sports equipment that we used to sell to uh, leisure centers sports centers uh, and youth clubs and so I I needed something to do for the next six months and my wife's who was my girlfriend at the time her cousin actually had a He worked for a plastic injection molding company and they were just looking for someone to do some assembly line operation stuff. And I thought, I'll do that. I'll just do something for the next six months. And basically from there, I was any opportunity I could to get off the the production line because it just drove me crazy. Basically, they gave me, they offered me an apprenticeship within about three months and it was either join the army or do the apprenticeship. And I took on like the apprenticeship or the training that was associated with that. And that got me into plastic injection molding. And that's where I started my plastic sort of tech experience. Yeah. So how long did you do that for that particular company? I worked in the UK for five years. Yeah, five years. And then I... My father just passed and it sort of freed me up then to, to leave the UK and then I convinced my wife and and my two and a half year old daughter that didn't take any convincing <laughs> that Australia should be our, our next port and Wendy agreed and it happened very quickly actually. Wendy, because I had Australian citizenship, Wendy pretty much automatically qualified and so did Megan. And it was just a case of selling our house and applying for a job. And I applied for a job and got a phone call actually from our largest competitor at the time. And a gentleman called Roger Tonks, who is very well known and very well respected in the industry, especially up here in Brisbane and Queensland. He is sort of one of the, the founders really, I think, for plastic injection molding as an industry in Queensland. And like I said, Roger, he offered me a job and he wanted me he, he wanted me actually to start on the Monday. I think he was talking to me on the Saturday and I had to remind him that I was in the UK. <laughs> and he said, well, can you be here in two weeks? And I, I committed to it and I did. I was there within two weeks. The same weekend, I got offered the job. We actually had an offer on our house as well. Wow. So everything just fell into place nicely. It was meant to be, wasn't it? Yeah. So how long did you work for Roger? Worked for Roger for eight years. Eight years? Yeah. And then? Well, just so at the seven-year mark uh, with working with uh, for Roger's company, I had a life-changing uh, moment where both my retinas came detached. Oh, wow. And I was lying in a hospital bed thinking, what have I done and where am I going with my life? And I, I knew that I needed change. And, you know, effectively, I, you know, I suppose to frame this a little bit, I had 2020 vision in both eyes at my last test, better than 2020 vision. And as I was going, just before I actually went in to be operated on, they told me that I had better than 20-20 vision still in my left eye, but my right eye needed to be operated on. And they told me that I was going to go blind if we didn't operate, and there was still a good chance that I would go blind if they, even if they did operate. Wow. And so they operated on me within about eight hours of being at the hospital. And I remember lying in the hospital bed thinking, wow, just trying to reflect on the last 24 hours. And reflecting, obviously, on my life. And I, I just thought that I, I needed to, to see more, do more, participate more, give back more. I, just, I was just looking for more. And I made a commitment to myself that as soon as I got the all clear from my specialist, that I would do something different. And almost 12 months to the day, doing something different was... Uh, acquiring BNC Plastics, which at the time was probably an undermanaged um, plastic injection molding company, and we, we acquired that with uh, Bob Horsell. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I have to go back. My own mind needs to know this. Were you climbing Mount Everest or something when this occurred? No. Look, I played quite a bit of football uh, in the UK, so soccer, uh, depending on who's listening. And I was a centre-half, a centre-back, so we did a lot of training in heading football. So heading a football is like being punched in the head. 
Uh, so professional footballers actually get their eyes checked on a regular basis for retina detachments and so do boxers. Anyone that has sort of impact uh, to their head, they get checked regularly. But as a, you know, at the time, as a semi-pro and just local footballer, that, that wasn't the case. We didn't get our eyes checked. Oh, my goodness. Wow. And so the specialists thought there was probably a disposition maybe for that as well. But that was that's what caused that's it. That's what caused it was mm. playing soccer. Mm. Wow. I hadn't heard that before. Usually it's it's about the you know, high altitude um, mountaineers that you hear this occurs to them. So life-changing experience, you decided to buy a company with a business partner. And then what? Well, I, I suppose if I just go back just a little bit, I actually, so I'm having this conversation with myself about looking for a new job. I did get actually offered a job in Perth. So when I came out, I got the all clear from the hospital about six, nine months later. I thought I was looking for something different and I got offered a job in Perth um, and I, they flew me over there, offered me the job and I came back and said to Wendell, I'd like to, I think I'd like to take this job as, as the next opportunity to learn and grow. And Wendy said, look, you know, I don't actually want to travel halfway around the world again. <laughs> <laughs> Perth feels like that for those that aren't familiar with Australia. It's on the other side of the country and it's only the only major city on the west coast of Australia. It's about a five-hour flight from Brisbane, you know, so it felt like halfway around the world to Wendy again. And so I, I, I picked up the phone, I told them I couldn't accept the job, and I actually started looking in the paper, and that's when we saw BNC Plastics. And I had a chat with my good friend Bob Horsell, and we both said, okay, let, let's give it a shake. But I remember having this conversation with myself, because at the age of 18, 19, I had my first business where it was a, it was a franchise in essence, and it was... It was it was pretty tough, I think, really, because we're it's cold calling, it's making your own appointments, it's getting in front of people, obviously getting those rejections. And I remember the saying when we closed that business that I would never go in business for myself again. <laughs> so I'm reflecting on this as we're looking at acquiring BNC plastics. So what made you say yes, knowing how hard it was going to be? Yeah, really good question. I think that I just think that I had personally there's more to give and I wanted to do explore the business world a little bit more and that was that was certainly the case I just felt that I had more to give I had more to do more to learn uh, more to grow certainly and and that just seemed like a, a really good opportunity at the time yeah and I think about the complexities of manufacturing here you are as a engineer perhaps at that stage molding tech molding tech so not yeah. even an engineer yeah and you're taking on a manufacturing company that has designers and toolists and like this is not a small takeover. It's actually pretty complex. How did it go? Yeah, look, I think so. I think we had our bases covered, uh, especially between myself and Bob. So Bob's a tool maker by trade from the UK. And me having a, a good molding tech background from the UK and uh, again, just working in Australia for eight years, I think just between us, and I also had a sales background as well, and I, I connect well with people and, you know, people, you know, there's a saying that people tend to do business with people they like or want to be like. And uh, that's certainly the case for me. And I just felt that like my own approach in terms of sales and, and technician is very much about educating the people that, educating is possibly the wrong word, but informing uh, the clients and informing the supplier and aligning values with the actual direction of where we wanted to go. So I think it was okay, really. Look, Bob had the design covered. He had the engineering covered. I had the molding tech skills covered, and we had the sales base covered. So we, we thought that we had most of our bases covered when we, we started. <laughs> and how did you fund the business? How did we fund it? Yeah. Yeah, we, we actually got loans against our homes. Wow. Yeah, so we actually got small business loans, and the equity we, the equity we put up was our homes. Big risk. Yeah, I think it is a risk. At the time, probably didn't really look at it as a risk. We obviously knew that it was, and we had lots of skin in the game, and and we were determined. And to be honest, we probably we were too naive, and we had no business acumen, and we learnt that very quickly. The first six months were very very difficult, and I remember having a good friend coming to see me and saying, "You know what? You've you've got the skill set. You know you can do this. Just keep persevering." and the guy's name uh, was David, David Hitchmo, and uh, we actually worked together for a number of years. 
And it was, I remind him of that because I, that conversation sticks in my mind when he said, no, just, just keep going, keep going, persevere, you know. Yeah, so the first six months were very difficult. You know, the first year, I think we lost, we lost money for the first two years going backwards. I had a good job. Uh, I had good hours and my wage halved, my hours doubled and we worked a lot harder than we probably should have done and we didn't have the acumen or the smarts we do now. Yeah. I, I think this is a common story amongst entrepreneurs. What year did you start? We started in 2006. Okay. So tw 12 years on, you decided to make some major changes, not just with the business relationship with Bob, but also in terms of the direction of the company. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? So I love nature and I love getting off the beaten track. And I think, you know, most people do. If you see this resurgence now, not resurgence, if you see this, like I think 50% of all cars that are bought now are four-wheel drives or four-wheel drive utes. At least in Australia. At least, sorry, at least in Australia, yeah. And so I actually think there's this, this momentum now, when you have a look at the industry, the lifestyle industry, the people want to get back to nature more and more. And I was certainly, I was certainly enjoying that. And we just noticed that on the beaches, even in remote areas, that there's rubbish everywhere. And we can see certainly an evidence of, of man, let's, let's say everywhere. Uh, or humankind, anyway, let's say that. And we just thought that, you know what? We actually need to be responsible ourselves here. And for a long time, I'd push back on using recycled materials in terms of as a business strategy. It was always considered to be, look, we can do that if you really want to. And we just thought, hang on, you know, if one person, one organization can make a change. So there's lots of people out there now looking to make these changes. And I think we just had that self-awareness moment, you know, personally, where we're like, hang on, we can make a difference here. And we can make a difference in the way that we develop product for our clients and for ourselves. So you made a statement just a minute ago saying, well, if you really want to, um, we'll use recycled plastic, essentially, is what you're referring to. Why is it that manufacturers do not like using recycled plastic? It is really just the continuity of supply often. I think that's the main reason. So as more and more of us uh, jump on board uh, with the, the recycle, reuse and reduce sort of ethos, what we will find in Australia is that we are going to have issues with feedstock. And so, again, that will start to change as we start to get people recycling more and organisations recycling, cleaning and reproducing these materials or reusing these materials so they can be repurposed. And, and we've obviously got, a, a, you know, we've got the globe, you know, the world that we can, um, we can actually get materials from as well. And we've actually got some feelers out looking at that now. It's really interesting. For looking for global suppliers of recycled plastic? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Mm. So what's the difference in cost? Because I know that that's been a deterrent for a lot of people to consider using recycled plastic as a feedstock versus virgin plastic. Yeah, look, I think that's a great question. So look, traditionally, when people look to use a recycled material, they're looking to use a recycled material because it's cheap. So that's what's been on the market for a long time. So it means that you're limited on the products that you can actually put the material into. And, and then they, often people are just looking for price. So it's a commodity part, something that's going to get buried in concrete. Now, or what's actually happening is that you get more and more engineering materials becoming available. And with the availability of these materials, it's opening up this whole range of product that we can now develop for. So it's changing. From a price perspective, sometimes it's the same as a prime material. Sometimes it's less. Sometimes it is a little bit more, just depending on the complexity of repurposing that material. Now, that's interesting, too, because when I was looking at feedstock, I saw that recycled materials were actually costing more than virgin plastic. It was that just an anomaly that I happened to stumble upon? No, I, I th you're right. It does depend on the actual material and the feedstock. You know, like, you know, when we talk about plastics and people, you know, there are there are tens of thousands of plastics and and that's part of the problem that we have in terms of recycling and getting the, the consistency of clean feedstock and having that separation so depending on the material of that feedstock depending on what work goes into separating it cleaning mm -hmm. it reproducing it and what 
what additives have to go back into it just to give it its properties back so it can be used. It, it can certainly affect the price. Because we've also talked about color. For some of my products that are indoor products, I don't want them to be black. <laughs> and we've talked about the challenges of getting feedstock that doesn't have some level of contamination in terms of color in it that turns everything into this, this ugly gray, essentially. Is that still an issue at the moment here in Australia? Yeah, look, it's probably an issue everywhere because if you have a think about how many different plastics there are out there, and then, for example, a lot of people ideally would like a clear because if they can get a clear or a natural colour, it can be coloured to anything they like. What's really interesting, that's, I, mean, I actually had a conversation about a month ago with David Katz, and David Katz is doing some fantastic work with the Plastic Bank, and he actually just re- met actually with the Pope, which is another story just recently in the Vatican. <laughs> we'll, have to, we'll have to follow up on that that's one later. That's a cool story. <laughs> but what he said was, that in, in the, currently he said that he said, so previously he said there's been this real pushback on colour. And he says what we're finding now is there's becoming more and more of an acceptance of having this sort of multicoloured looking part. And he said the reason for that is that people now go, when I've got my, my mug or whatever the part is and it's multicoloured, they actually, everyone knows immediately it's recycled, you know. And so people seem to be accepting that more and more, which I thought was really interesting. Now, when, now David's from Canada, he is. And so certain parts of the world are certainly more, more forward thinking maybe than others and more accepting of that. So it'd be interesting to see what, uh, you know, who would really accept that and in what products. Well, certainly I know that my own products, some of them are indoor products that you use on your home. And that would be challenging because most people don't want you know, anything but a wider cream colored piece of furniture in their house, as an example. Yeah, 100%. And, and so we are limited then on how much clear or natural or white that we can source. And what will happen is that will become more of a premium price because more and more people will sort it. So it, as you know now, recycled, recycled materials is becoming more and more of a commodity now as well. Mm. It's becoming a currency, you know? Yeah, well, sure. I mean, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create demand for a product that might otherwise go into the tip. So... My question then goes, goes back to what we started to talk about, and then we kind of sidetracked on the complexities of working with recycled plastic. You made some decisions as a company, so, but you as obviously the leader of the company, last year to change your strategic direction. And I actually grabbed this off your website. I hope you don't mind. And it actually talked about our why. So I assume this is what you consider your mission statement of sorts. Every day we believe in pushing the boundaries of discovery through innovation and technology to recycle and reuse and reduce. Like that's unusual for a manufacturing company, especially one that didn't start off wanting to do work in recycled plastic. What changed? I think it was just generally that, that social awareness. More and more, look, Five Oceans actually may have helped us just shift shift our thinking a little bit there as well and then we realized from a business perspective that you know we can make a difference and so we literally just we started to strategize with that within the organization Uh, so we had some people come in and help us with that strategy and we put the strategy piece together we involved our team all the way through it we've been talking to our suppliers we've been talking to our customers and everyone said look we're on board with you let's do this so we thought let's let's take the lead let's change the strategy let's make a difference are you going to have to let some customers go if you're going down this direction? Well, no, what, so what we're saying with our customers right now is that if we were to ba- if we were to base, I believe anyway from the research that I've done, if we were ba- to base just our business on recycled, on fully recycled materials alone, we, I don't know how long we'd be in business for. Uh, so what we're saying to our customers now when we look at the projects, let's have a look at the materials that can be recycled. So if we haven't got a feedstock available for that's 100% recycled, let's have a look at you know reuse. So once the, once the product's come to the end of its life cycle, how are we going to close the loop? How can we capture that material and recycle it and put it back, close that loop? So they're the conversations we're having. Okay, so you're looking truly at a circular economy that if you have to start with virgin materials for whatever reason, that you will have a way to take that material and recycle it back into the process somehow. 100%. Yeah, brilliant. And that was one of the criteria that I had in my own business for you. <laughs> so that's, that's, it's, it's lovely to hear that, um, that other companies are considering the circular economy need as well. 
I know you have some of your own projects that you're working on too. They're top secret. Yeah, well, we don't have to talk about <laughs> things, but are they, can we at least say, are, are, they, are you planning to use recycled plastics? Yeah, we are. Look, I suppose if you have a look at our Horizon sort of two and three projects, you know, we are looking at our own proprietary products and our own proprietary products in the lifestyle space. And we are looking at, we're looking at fully recycled materials. So whether, if we can, so there's also recycled materials now from a, a 3D printing or a digital manufacturing, which is on offer as well. So that's really interesting. So we're happy to obviously injection mold 100% recycled materials for our products. And the other horizon that they're looking at is what can we actually digitally manufacture using recycled materials as well. Now, it might not always be the case again, we can use a 100% recycled material, but as long as we're looking at closing the loop, when the product comes into its life cycle, it's gonna fit in with our, with our strategy and our, and our purpose, our why. And when you talk about laser printing in general, I think a lot of people don't quite understand how that works. You're, you're specifically talking about small quantities of, of maybe customized products when you're thinking about 3D printing. Is that right? Yeah, look, interesting. Technology is evolving, and we are actually heading our way over to Frankfurt in November for one of the largest uh, digital manufacturing trade fairs, which is called Formnext in, in Frankfurt. And th so there's technology there now that does allow you to actually print or digitally manufacture, 3D print, in scale. So okay. traditionally, or not traditionally, over the last few years, technology has changed for the machinery, and probably more importantly, or just as importantly, the actual materials themselves have evolved as well. So there's certainly opportunity in that space. Okay. Well, I'll be definitely looking for it for my own products to know that we could do 3D manufacturing because they'll certainly make things faster and cheaper if you don't have to buy molds, <laughs> which is obviously the biggest cost of manufacturing. The average person doesn't know that much about manufacturing. They don't, they don't understand recycling in terms of what they're doing in their own household bins and how that might impact the materials that you're getting to put into new products. Are there any tips or just information you want to share with our listeners about recycled products and how it impacts what you're trying to do on a manufacturing side? No tips. That's a really good question. I think, you know, I reckon it, it actually just starts as something simple as it starts at home. You know, so many of us, we've got a recycle bin and so many of us just throw something that can be recycled into the bin and it goes for landfill. Now, maybe over the last few years, that, that certainly changed. We've obviously got our recycle bins and uh, hopefully now most of the stuff that's been recycled in the recycle bins is going to recycling and separation stations so it can genuinely be recycled and reused. I think just starting at home and becoming aware there is so important. We often think that we don't can't make a difference ourselves individually, but often if we're making a difference individually, it just we have this this positive effect that just rolls on through the family and our friends and other contacts. So there's a really good start point there. And I think just with having that mindset, having that sort of front of mind, it then leads through to everything you you know you think you say and you do in your life. And if you're genuinely looking at you know, developing your own products or changing the materials on your current products, it just, it just shifts the way that we think a little bit. And it, we can sort of influence the end user a little bit then maybe as well, if we're talking from a business perspective. Yeah, yeah for sure. So Royston, how can our listeners find you if they want to connect with you online? or your website, what would you recommend? Yeah, look, we, we're up online like everybody else is. We've got our website there, you know, BNC Plastics. And dot com dot au. Yeah, so it's bcplastics.com.au. And so we've got a contact form there, and there's some phone numbers as well. That's, that's the best way to find us. We've got LinkedIn profiles and some social media profiles. So the, websites, the website or the phone is always the best place to point of contact. Fantastic. Is is there anything else you wanted to share with our listeners before we go? No, look, just uh, thank you, Tammy, for reaching out to us. And thank you for putting me in the spotlight here with this podcast. <laughs> oh, you're very welcome. I'm sure down the road we'll, we'll talk about it further because I, I would be very interested in knowing how many new customers you bring on board that are specifically interested in you because of recycled plastic and also the challenges of the supply of feedstock into the products that you're trying to make for people like me, because I know that that's going to be 
potentially a, a, a bottleneck for us in the future. And what are we going to do about it? But at the same time, so many of us are making things out of recycled plastic so that plastic doesn't go into the tip. So thank you very much, Royston, for um, your time today. And, and thanks for just, you know, thinking broader beyond just making things. Oh, thank you, Tammy. Thanks for joining me today on this podcast. If you want to see the links or to review any information we spoke about today, then check out our show notes on this channel or on our website, plasticsrevolution.com. If you found anything interesting or helpful at all, I'd really appreciate it if you subscribe to our show and to tell others. Stay tuned next week as I chat to another innovator, change maker, or fellow entrepreneur who is leading the plastics revolution. This is Tammy Vendange. Be kind to animals and Mother Nature. <laughs>